Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jason Jasperson. I teach in the visual arts department here at Bethany. And um, we have a capstone exhibit for you tonight. I think a lot of you are here for that reason. You know what you're here for. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Abigail Skorenke, who um, I, I see as a determined, generous person, someone who has a strong will and uses that strong will to push at the boundaries of how much she can give rather than how much she can take. You're going to hear stories, uh, very interesting stories today. Um, and as you hear those stories, I want you to keep in mind the title of the exhibit. I, I won't try to pronounce this. Abby's pretty good at pronouncing this, but it translates to, but not all is lost. Keep that in your mind, but not all is lost. Abigail uh, is a junior this year. She's doing her capstone exhibit early because she had the foresight last year as a sophomore to see that when she will be a senior, she'll be too busy student teaching. This is a symptom of her strength. She can do many, many things. Um, I'll, I'll make an incomplete list for you. She's a varsity athlete in basketball, track, fall sport? Okay, basketball and track, that's all. She's also uh, an education major, which is a very demanding program. She's a studio art major, which is a so-so program. <laughs> Um, she works, you know, she has jobs, and um, in, in the time that she's made this work, she's also, uh, she got married. That's a, you know, that takes a lot of planning, a lot of work, and she's filled out paperwork for, um, for immigration in a very sensitive location. Uh, and there are other things. I always find out new things that Abby's doing, and she just sort of shrugs, like, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, so I really admire how you show up and how you just get it done. Please welcome Abby Skorenke. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. My, uh, my husband dabbed me up before I got up here and said, you've got this, so I believe him. <laughs> I am so happy to see all of these familiar faces. It's such a blessing that all of you guys could come down here. <laughs> I, art has been such a big, huge part of my life, especially recently. And whenever I paint, I just feel like I wanna dance. <laughs> it's, it brings me so much joy. And God has given me a gift and I feel like I just have to use it to the best of my ability, and I feel like it's my duty to capture his creation in the best way that I can. And I want to pull things from life that are beautiful, and when I say beautiful, I don't just mean things that we look at, I mean conceptually too, stories that we hear, and events that really resonate with us. And one of those events that really helped me and guided me through the paintings that you're looking at today was the story of my husband and their beautiful family. <laughs> and so first I want to introduce them by looking at their paintings. So over here we have a painting of my husband. His name is Kostya Skorenki. It's a little hard to pronounce so you can practice it. And then, <laughs> and then we have next to him is Petro his father, Skrinky. They're both with us here today, along with Kostia's mother. Her name is Ala Skrinky. And then next to her, we have their little chihuahua dog. His name is Oscar. <laughs> He's a cutie. And then we have over here, Kostia's younger sister. Her name is Yava. And then on the far side wall, we have a picture of Kostia's grandmother Svetlana and her twin sister Ala. And so before I tell you the story about today, I wanted to put you guys in the mindset that what you're gonna hear is a story and to them it's a memory. And so whereas we're gonna hear about it, they lived it. And so with that mindset, we're gonna begin with February 24th. <laughs> So on February 24th in the year 2022, 
Russia launched a full-scale invasion on the country of Ukraine. Allah and Petro were in their home and they stepped outside their door and there were missiles flying above their head, touching down blocks from their house. There were Russian helicopters flying in the air, more than, Allah told me more than she could count. And they had to make a really quick decision to flee the city. And so Allah, she left Kyiv, or Irpin, which was the suburb of Kyiv that they lived in. And they fled the city without, she fled the city without Petro because Petro was ordered to stay back in case he was to get drafted to fight. And so she drove all the way from Kyiv to the city of Zhytomyr. And she, she explained this drive to me as one of the scariest moments of her life because we hear a lot about main events that happen in war um, and main things that happen, but we don't hear about how when she was driving, there were vehicles crashing in front of her and behind her because people were passing out in their vehicles because out of fear. And there were missiles dropping down just blocks from her vehicle. And as she was driving, she saw tanks, tanks driving from Jatomer towards the city that she was just fleeing, full of young men. And all she could think about was her son and the fact that those young men are connected to families. And those families are sending their sons to war. And so when Ala reached Jatomer, she drove all the way to the city of Kremenitz. And when she reached Kremenitz, her and Petro uh, got on a phone call and they made a plan. And the plan was for Ala, for Ala to leave the country if she had the opportunity and cross the border of Poland to get to Java, who was living in Munich at the time. And Ala, and so the next morning at 5 a.m., a major bridge outside of the city of Irpin blew up by Ukrainian soldiers in order to stop Russian soldiers from getting into the city. And so Petro, who was still in Irpin, thought to himself, we need to get out now or we're not going to have the opportunity to leave. And so Petro left, left the city along with the refugees and friends staying in their house because they had nowhere to go and he started driving through back roads and fields in order to avoid the Russian tanks that were shooting down people along the road. And so in a matter of 24 hours, Petro was right outside the city of Kyiv. Ala was at the border of Poland. Kostia was in America. Yava is in Munich. And Oscar is still with Ala. <laughs> and on February 24th, my husband was crying when he called me. And I was thinking to myself, oh no, what happened? Did he get in a car crash? Did he injure himself? Did he fail another Hebrew test? I don't know. <laughs> but no, the next, the next phrase he said really struck me. He said, he said, Abby, Russia is firing missiles on my home. And it was then it struck me that this situation is, it's bigger than we think, it's bigger than we thought. And now we've made a connection with the people that are in Ukraine right now. There's a connection with the people that we love and they're in danger. And all of a sudden the situation becomes 10 times more amplified. And so I remember a week later, a week, a week or two later, we were sitting in the living room watching the national news and Kostya stands up out of his chair and he's like, pause it right now, stop, rewind. And so I pause it and I rewind. And on, on the screen is a picture of Kostya's old friend and he's carrying his baby girl in one arm and a giant rifle in the other. And it was really hard for Kosti to see that and realize that my friend is in the middle of war and I'm sitting here in America doing nothing. And so Kostya, he was going through a really hard time because he's like, how do I continue with my life? How do I keep going to school? And how do I just keep going to classes? Why aren't we doing something? And so 
He went to go visit a family friend. Her name is Antoinette. She lives in Georgia. He flew down to Georgia and he told her the same thing that he was telling me. And she said, I had a friend that was at the seminary around the time of 9-11. And that friend went to the seminary president and said, why are, we still do, why are we still continuing school? Why haven't we stopped? And the president looked at him and he said, he said, you don't understand. Out there, they are fighting for lives. And in here, we are fighting for souls. And so for Kostia, that really helped him get through that time because he realized, I am doing the greatest thing that I can do right now. And that is put all of my trust and all of my hope in God. And so that brings us to this painting. <clears throat> when we look at this painting, it shows Kostia in a crouched position, very vulnerable, and he's praying. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's working. There we go. <clears throat> And so when we look at this painting, on the right, we have light streaming in from an unknown source, and it's illuminating Kostia in this dark environment. And on the left, there's smoke that's surrounding him and encasing him. And this smoke is inspired by a verse from the book of Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. The word meaningless, translated into Hebrew, is the word Hevel, which is the title of this painting. And Hevel, translated back into English, literally means smoke or vapor, because it's out of reach. You can't grasp it. You can't grab onto it. And so in the same way, the situation in Ukraine was out of Kostya's reach. And so all he could do was hope and pray that everything was going to be OK. And all he could do was trust. And so. Kostia's family has always, their lives have always revolved around dance. And Yava embraced it fully. <laughs> Yava, she's living in Munich right now. She's a very prestigious dancer and she's part of a extremely hard regiment. And she, in, at the time of war, Yava would wake up at 6 a.m. She would go and dance, and she would go, go to bed around 10 a.m., 10 p.m., sorry. <laughs> and then she would do it all over again. And she got into a routine. But this routine was interrupted when war began because she had to change her mindset. And there were moments when she was about to go on stage, but she's crying hours before because she doesn't know if her family is safe. She doesn't know if they're going to be OK but she had to put on a face, go out on the stage, and dance her heart out. And I think we can relate a lot about, a lot to this, a lot about basketball. Because when I think about basketball, before I get onto the floor, I think, okay, I'm going through a hard time with school, I'm trying to catch up with my homework, but when I go out on the floor, all I can do is not think about that and just play my heart out and do my best. And so in the same way, Yava did that. She, she drowned out the noise, she drowned out everything, and she did what she knew how to do. And so this painting, it's very intimate. It's like a secret that we weren't supposed to know about. When you look at it, she's frozen in the middle of a dance, not realizing that somebody's looking at her. And the, the elements, like the black paint here on the right draws your, draws your eyes from the top right. I just realized I forgot to change this. <laughs> from the top right of the painting all the way down to, to the bottom left corner, her hand. And it, there's movement in the painting in the same way that she's moving. <clears throat> and so going to Ala now. So when Ala was in Kremenitz, she, when Ala was in Kremenitz, she received a phone call from a friend. And her friend told her that Ala, Russian soldiers have already begun shooting people in the streets. And Ala hadn't heard from her friend for three months later. 
she called her friend and, and she happened to pick up and she said that we were hiding in a bunker for three months with 15 other people and because Russian soldiers were living in our home. And again, there's another connection that, that Allah had to make. Like I'm over here in Munich and my friend is living in a bunker and Russian soldiers are living in her home. And it, it's that, that feeling of helplessness and what do I do about that? And Ala, she when she drove to the border of Poland, it was too crowded and she had to drive to Hungary. And when she crossed Hungary, she, she drove all the way to Munich and hadn't slept for three days. And she explained, she explained to me how when she saw Yeva, her knees were buckling beneath her and just knowing that her daughter was safe was the best thing she could find out in that situation. And so Ala, to get through all of this, all of the difficult nights, she just had to move on and, and trust that God had her husband's safety in his hands. And that was a difficult time for Yava because she had to comfort her mother too, every single night, who wouldn't hear from Petro for sometimes weeks because connection was cut off. And so Allah, to get through all of this, this commotion drowning, drowning and filling her mind, she was part of the, she became part of this program that helped Ukrainian ballet students get out of Ukraine and place them in homes and schools so that they can continue their education and in a safe manner. And so tying that to this painting, it shows Allah reaching down, reaching down to an unknown source and pulling them to safety. In the background, we have blue and yellow indicating the Ukrainian flag, or ooh, I keep forgetting, <laughs> indicating the Ukrainian flag, or also, also a landscape, the blue sky touching the wheat field, which is also another way to symbolize the Ukrainian flag. And I remember painting this, and it went through many iterations, and I remember taking a glass pain and full of blue oil paint and shoving it on the canvas and just sliding it around <laughs> creating i like to create problems for myself so that i can solve them <laughs> and so that that definitely this painting definitely went through that so it was very very fun for me just like all of these <laughs> okay so now we're going to go to petro Petro, throughout all of this time, he was still in the city, but rewinding back to when he was still in the city of Kremenitz. He fled Kiev and reached Kremenitz. And when he was in Kremenitz, he, he would drive people from, from around that area to the Poland border and, so that they could cross the border. And he would drive military vehicles from the border all the way to the front lines. And he's seen more than their whole family in Ukraine. He's seen things that we don't want to even describe or mention. And that's what makes his story so strong is because throughout everything, he had to deal with the fact that he's away from his family, but he had to keep helping people so that he could drown it all out and just trust God that he was gonna be okay. And so to get through that, he would deliver food to houses, help them rebuild their homes. And I remember getting a phone call about a month or two into the whole war and from Kostya saying, my father just received a draft letter. And so that was really hard because Kostya hadn't seen his father in four years. And so all that Petro and Kostya could think was, I'm not going to see my father again. And it seemed that their reunion was only going to be in heaven. And through many prayers, which is all we could do, we could only pray, Jesus gave us a miracle. <laughs> and 
he went in to get his medical examination and showing them the medical paperwork it, with his past career in dance and his injuries, they said, we don't want you because of your injuries. You're free to leave the country. And so right, right after that, he left the country towards Allah and he reached Munich. And when he got to Munich, Allah and Petro, they, they uh, signed up for the Ukrainian refugee program to go to America and they got approved. And so they made their way to America. <clears throat> and so when you look at this painting, it shows Petro driving, because that's what he did when he was in Ukraine. He would drive military tanks. He would drive people to the borders. He would drive to go help, help them rebuild their homes and deliver food. And this painting is really simple when you look at it. There's only detail in his face. There's detail. There's detail in his hands. So the people there can see. There's detail in his hands and in the steering wheel. And there's only quick strokes of black acrylic paint uh, outlining his garments. And so, and then there's just the outline of the blue window of the vehicle to show that he's inside of a vehicle. And you might think, why paint so simply? It's because you want to put people's focus or the viewer's focus on what's important, and that's him. He's, I want to tell a story with this painting, and I don't need all of the little tiny details or all of the commotion that you might see. I just need people to focus on what's important. And so I had a lot of, a lot of fun painting this painting. Okay, so now let's go to Oscar. <laughs> you might think, where did Oscar come into play? So Oscar, this entire time, was with Allah on the drive from, let me, sh oh, well, the map's at the beginning. So <laughs> he was with Allah from the drive from Irpin all the way to Jatomer and Kremenitz. And Oscar, he now, he now, <laughs> has heart problems because, because of that day. It was a very traumatic event for him. But it took more paperwork to get Oscar over to America than it did to get the people over. <laughs> I remember Kostya just pulling his hair out. He, he's like, this dog. <laughs> but, but we're so happy that he made it. It was such a blessing that everybody be, could be reunited all the way down to the dog. It, he was worth it. <laughs> he was so, so worth it. And so now we're going to look at Svetlana and Ala on the far side there. <clears throat> Sve Svetlana and Ala, Ala's story I really wanted to include because it really resonated with me because they're twins and I'm also a twin. <laughs> and it, their story shows just this sisterly love that you can't deny. And Svetlana is Kostya's grandma, and Ala went with Kostya's mother, Ala, to Munich. And when they were applying for the Ukrainian refugee program, Ala, Ala, Kostya's mom, <laughs> they're both named Ala, because Svetlana named uh, her daughter after her twin sister, which is the sweetest thing to me. And Ala said, I'm not going to go with you to America. I can't leave my twin sister. And so she drove all the way back to where her twin sister was because she couldn't leave her. And in the same way that all of them were reunited, she, her, her destination was just different. She had the same goal. She wanted to be reunited with her sister, but their destination was in America and hers was in with her sister. And so I had to include that story because I think it's beautiful to see such a strong sisterly love. And when you look at that painting, you might think it, it looks a little unfinished, but to me, that was the last painting I did. And it feels like it's the strongest because I got in this state where 
I'm going to, I, I entered the flow state where, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw their faces and I'm going to paint them. And then I'm going to draw their garments in a very flowy and blocky and very, just like kind of throwing paint on the canvas based off of a feeling. What needs to be amplified? And figuring out the balance of the painting with the pipes above, indicating that they're in a bunker, was seemed like it was the final step of that painting. So yeah, I loved painting that painting too. <laughs> and so now, today, everybody is reunited in America and Svetlana and Allah are reunited in Ukraine. And God has answered everybody's prayer. And it's so beautiful seeing God's hand through all of it. It's such a huge blessing. And so with that, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> But not all is lost. So uh, I suspect you might have some questions, and we'd like to facilitate that. Ooh, easy, <laughs> easy there. Um, so Abby, Abby can field some questions, and um, Petro and Ala and Kost is here too, hovering in the back. So you want to run this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna. You guys can come up here, and then feel feel free. feel free to ask me questions about the paintings. And if you have questions about their story, feel free to ask them too. So you guys can um, come up here. So. And I wanted to say just before we begin, uh, Kost or not Kostya, Petro will be speaking in Ukrainian, and Kostya will be translating, and Allah, too. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any questions? <laughs> Feel free to ask. Who? Oh. Yes, Andy. <laughs> the story you told me. My dad, my dad has a very strong opinion, and he says, "For now, I consider them terrorists." And what else could you think of terrorists? That's that's what he thinks. Seventy percent of our city, seventy percent of our city, is ruined. Bit of a lot of my friends. Звалтовано малих дітей, старших людей, бо вбиті наші сусіди, тому яке може бути, яке може бути ставлення поки що. My mom said, um, 70 percent of our town where we lived is destroyed. A lot of our friends were killed, our neighbors were killed. Um, a lot of children that many people knew got raped. And uh, and because it's ongoing for now, um, they don't know how to how to really comment or feel about that. So, yeah. Should I answer too? Yeah. <laughs> um, I say, I'm studying to be a pastor and a minister of the gospel. And I know that every person that was created is created by God, no matter good or bad you are. And I believe that every Russian who believes in God in the end of the day will go to heaven. Um, but Forgiveness isn't just something that you can just shake it off and say, oh, I'll just do it. It takes time and it takes healing 
And for now, I'll say emotions and feelings are very mixed and sour. Um, I've talked to Russian refugee, um, actually at the seminary. Uh, he fled Russia as soon as war started because he didn't want to get drafted and he didn't want to fight the war in Ukraine because he doesn't believe in it. So that taught me and showed me that there are Russians who don't believe in this war and who are willing to leave their life behind just to not be involved in, in, in the crime that's happening right now. But uh, if I talk about Russians, the ones that are being drafted and the ones that are willingly making a choice to go and fight in the war, I have a very, I'll say I have a very sour feeling. Not in a bad way, it's just forgiveness is something that takes time you can just like shrug it off of your shoulders like it's nothing. So, and... And my dad would like to tell, to tell one story. Irpin, Irpin, the city, the town, the suburb of Kiev where we lived in Bucha is the town that's right next to us. And they're like, um, they're like twin cities. They're like, they're like almost like one town considered. And when Russian soldiers were kicked out from uh, uh, Russia, uh, when Russian soldiers were kicked out and driven back from Bucha and Irpin, and they started clearing out the territories of our towns uh, to make it safe for people to go back in. Uh, the right next to our church, it, in Bucha, right next to our church, they found buried mother and her little child just uh, covered, like just taped together in a duct tape. And they tried to separate them in order to bury them properly. And uh, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, the guys who are, uh, I don't know how you call those guys. Ben, you can help me. The guys who are um, neutralizing bombs, what do you call them? Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they told them not to touch the bodies, not to do this. They prohibited doing, doing that. When, 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 when soldiers carefully cut the tape to separate the bodies and uh, they used uh, equipment to check for any bomb or any trap. Between mother and a child was a bomb. Uh, they 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 planted a bomb in between the child and the mom. And then and then and then and then after and there are dozens of stories like that. And after stories like that, you can kind of just assume what the feelings are about Russian soldiers and Russian people right now towards my from my family. My dad says, for now, he doesn't believe those are soldiers that are in Ukraine. They believe, he believes those are the men from Russia that came to Ukraine. They're all rapists and terrorists. Those are not soldiers. They're not warriors, and they do not have any honor. They do not have any humility. Yeah, go ahead. Ми з багато з ми з Ебі багато говорили і Ебі від тебе, що поки ми не приїхали, коли ми приїхали з України вже в Сполучені Штати, з Ебі Ебі слухала нашу історію і так вона ділилася і ми я щаслива, що в мене така дота інла і я 
і що в неї такі таланти, і дав Господь, і вона їх може розвивати, і сьогодні от через її картини багато, багато людей може почути і нашу історію, нашої сім'ї. Це, це, це частина України і частина, так, частина того, що переживають всі люди, так, що через нашу історію будуть розуміти, яка історія в багатьох сімей українських на сьогодні. My mom said that she's, first of all, she's very happy. She was happy when Abby came up with an idea to work on this project. And Abby have brought it up to her over time, over the phone first, when they were still in Munich, because she was already working for a while on project with Yeva. And then, uh, and then she heard all the stories from me in person. And then when, when they got over here, she was able to talk to them more in person and learn more from them. And my mom says, she, first of all, it's a memory for them. But it's not a memory that they would want to hide. It's a memory that they would want to share because that's just for, through the, those memories and the stories that they have to tell to other people. Um, more people will be informed. More people are going to know about Ukraine. More people are going to know and be aware of unfortunate stories because there are many very similar stories of Ukrainian people that are li living out their life right now. And... My mom said she's very thankful for the daughter-in-law that she has, a very talented daughter-in-law, who was able to tell that story like no one else could. So. Um, for Kostia's painting, before I started, I connected it to a Bible verse. And for all of the other ones, I connected a Bible verse to them after I painted. Because, f for one, Kostia, Kostia's story is a little different, just because he was in America when he started. And so, I was thinking, that was a, that was a time that we were really relying and totally focused on the fact that this is in God's hands. And so I thought, what better way to start a painting than to have a verse in mind? And so that's that's how that started. But with the other ones, I heard their story and I and I thought to myself, I need to do something about it. I need to, and the best thing that I know how to do is just paint. And that's what I did. And when I when I was finished painting them, I connected Bible verses to all of them because I thought throughout this whole situation, Christ is at the center of everything. And you can see his hand clearly through this whole situation. And so what better way than to connect a Bible verse to every single painting and every single story that they went through. So yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you tell it better. Of all places, New Ulm. We met in New <laughs> Uh No, I'm an international student, so I can't work. I cannot. I couldn't work anywhere but on campus. So over the summer after my freshman year, I worked on campus, and I was coming back from work to my car. And I saw her sitting and talking to Nicole Porter, which is our mutual friend and my classmate. And I saw her and I was like, she's pretty cute, but <laughs> <laughs> I really wasn't feeling it. I was after work, sweaty, tired, you know. <laughs> so I went to my car, but Nicole saw me. So she waved to me and she said, hey, come over here. I'll introduce you to my friend. So I came over, we talked. Then uh, I went back to my car, found her Instagram. <laughs> I followed her and then and then a couple of days later she posted this awesome post with her with one of her artworks and I thought to myself, "Oh, it's really impressive." But then I thought, "Why am I just thinking that? I can just text her that." So <laughs> <laughs> so I texted her that and then uh, and then a couple of days later I asked her if she wants to go out to Flandreau, went for a couple of walks and then just kind of went from there.
I, re I remember when... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. When I didn't even know him, and he liked all of my posts. <laughs> from like five years ago and I was like wow <laughs> and and for in America everybody's laughing because they know it's not normal to stalk somebody on Instagram but all of his family members when they followed me every single one of them liked every single one of my posts <laughs> Because, and, and later on in our relationship, I asked him, why did you do that? And, and he said, well, that's why you post them on Instagram is for people to look at, right? So that's, I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Parker? Uh-huh. So... Yava, when I painted Yava, it was before I knew, I painted in the summer, and I painted this before I knew kind of what I was doing for my entire capstone. And I knew that Yava, she's such a hard worker, and she loves dance so passionately, I thought, what, like, what better way than to express her passion than to paint it? <laughs> because that's just what I love to do. And so when it came to painting Yava, I, I was, in this flow state where I would paint her, her, uh, her body and her, her um, clothing in detail. But then when it would came, come to certain parts, you kind of try something out when you paint and you're like, oh, I kind of like that. And so it was just kind of this state where I got in where it, I just loved doing it and then I would keep doing it and exploring different things and trying new things. And so, for Yava's hair, it, it wasn't something that relates to her story. It was, it was a experience that I had when I was painting that I can't really describe. It's something that, it, it's undescribable. I have no words for it, honestly, but it was very fun, I can tell you. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't really have anything to relate to her story, but. There's actually a very good question. There is a difference. There's one painting that's very different from any other painting here. I mean, I guess maybe two. OK. <laughs> but one that I think of is my grandma and her twin sister, because all of those stories are, are um, memories of our lives from past. This painting is a representation of the story that my grandma is living out right now. This is one painting that will be very different from all those that are here because this painting shows the life that every Ukrainian is going through right now. And, you know, the war has been dragging on for forever, but it seems like the other country, Russia, has unlimited supply of rockets because their airstrikes is consistent. It's throughout the entire country. The blackouts every year is getting worse and worse. Um, food supply is getting shorter and shorter and, and it's harder to supply food and people go down to the bunker and sleep overnight at the bunker and live life like this on a daily basis and there are some people that to the got to the became came to the point where they started to ignore airstrikes they literally would just like not go to the bunker anymore they just stay home because like whatever and and some and some people still do it's just that's, that's one painting that's different. It's just like, that's, that's the life. When you look at the painting, that's what the life she's living out now, so. They are semi-safe. Nobody's safe in the entire country because in any day, in any hour, the missile can just fly right into your house, into your window. Um, those missiles can fly hundreds of kilometers. They can launch it from one side of the country to another, no problem probably knows as a military person but um so nobody's safe there's no war or escalation where she lives there's no war an active war or active collision between ukrainian and russian military going on in the west of ukraine but there are constant uh, russian strikes and there are multiple rockets that have landed near or in my grandma's town so it's not like they're safe but they are safer
Oh, yeah. So it's, it was a question about the mission work where the church is allocated. Uh, a lot of our churches, there's a map of Crimea right here. Crimea is, I still consider the Ukraine. It was annexed by Russia in 2015. We had, we had a church in Crimea. We had multiple churches here. We had one church in Kiev, and we had one church in Ternopil, and then we had one church in, here in Kremenets. Kremenets is around here. So um, half, of our, half of our mission and uh, half of the churches that we've had were in the south of Ukraine. So all the people from those churches and pastors had to evacuate, and majority of the people right now in the west. Uh, the church, you mean? The church building? Okay. Yeah, um, it's actually my home church. There's a church in Kiev that was built in 2016, and we had an opening of that church. And yes, it is still, they still sometimes conduct services when when the airstrikes isn't so bad and it was, it was safer. Um, they, throughout the war, there was like de-escalation and escalation of the war. So there was a time of escalation when Russia invaded and there was Russian troops right here on the edge of Kiev. When there was de-escalation and troops retreated, a lot of people came back to Kiev and including even my dad came back for a couple of weeks and even conducted some services. But then there is another escalation where they started launching, la launching rocket attacks on the entire city, and a lot of people had to retreat and move out, move out again. So, but no, the church building's still intact. It's downtown of Kiev. It's in between of the buildings and stuff. So, but I'm pretty sure it's still standing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware, and I don't. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. There, there are two churches. There's one, the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, the one that I was just telling you about. The one you were talking about is actually a German Lutheran Church, and they they conducted uh, German uh, they conducted German services. Even this, yeah, yeah, and the, and this church is still standing. Yeah, it's still still is standing. Uh, dance, dance was always a big part of our family. I have multiple dancers in my family. My dad was a professional dancer until the start of the war. And he was thinking about retiring, so when the war broke out, he just kind of like finished his retirement and he retired. But he, he danced for his whole life since he was 20s. Um, no, it was a folk style and modern. It's a... Uh, Ensemble of uh, song and dance of the military forces of Ukraine. So it was it. She did a lot of folk style dancing. Um, that that's what my dad did. Um, I have an uncle. His name is Stas. He's right now live. He now lives in Florida. He just recently got a contract with Miami Miami City Ballet. 
and he's a principal dancer there and uh, he did ballet his whole life and he graduated the same school in Kiev that my sister graduated. And then my sister is also a ballet dancer and I have another uncle, his name is Valera, he's Astas' brother. And uh, he used to be, he studied to be a dancer, he used to be a dancer, a uh, Ukrainian folk dancer too. And then he moved to Europe and he lived in multiple countries and now he worked in in circus for a while, uh, as a first as a dancer, then as an acrobat, and now he does like yoga with his wife, and he's like a yoga instructor. <laughs> so, so, but yeah, so the dance was always a big, a big part of my family's life. The only people in our family that never danced was me and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> she's in Munich. She's she's in school in Munich. Yeah. Uh, probably more like two, around two. One in Chernobyl, one in Kremenets. I'm not sure about all the other ones. And maybe church in Kyiv once in a while conducts services. But the last time... Oh, and also in Mykolaiv, which is in the south, they just came back to that territory was also freed and people are slowly coming back and they're slowly starting out the services too. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, Vacation Bible School? I was a translator for the Vacation Bible School in the summer, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. It's also in the West. Do, so you know, so you know Horpenchuk, right? Okay, very well, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so the painting that took me the longest was that one because uh, I had worked on it throughout the whole summer. So I didn't have school and the other stresses of life towering over me. So I was able to just focus on that painting. And each painting that I did took me kind of faster and faster because I would kind of get the groove of it. And probably the second painting that took me the longest was Kostya's painting. And you can kind of see the difference between Kostya's painting compared to his dad, who is back to back to, with him. Because Kostya's painting is very detailed. It, it's almost like while I was painting it, I was very tense and kind of focused on, okay, I need to get this right, and I need to get this right. But when I went to Petro's painting, which was my fourth painting that I did, it was more of a, okay, I'm just gonna have fun with this one and enjoy the process. And I, I let it come to me and just swam in it, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, a lot of people that know me will tell me that I'm a very happy person. And whenever I walk around and I see something really, really beautiful, I just, I get really, really excited about it. I'm like, oh, I wanna do something about that. And so in the same way, art is what I do about it. And so art gives me kind of an escape from everything that I do from uh, school and all the tests that I have, this is something that I enjoy and something that I want to do. Instead of maybe studying for my science test, <laughs> I spend time uh, painting. And so I guess it just provides me with a sort of joy that I can't really describe. And it gives me just a space that I can live in and exist in that uh, other things don't really give me. Yes? So all of these paintings are, are really substantial in like every sense of the word. Like they're, they're beautifully done. They've got a lot of meaning uh, behind them. They've got religious significance. Uh, they're, and they're big. Uh, <laughs> 
they, they seem to not just be intended to be decorations for a wall. They seem like uh, paintings with a mission. So, so is there a mission? Is, what's, what's next for these pieces? So all of these pieces uh, are, well, I heard you say big. <laughs> and the reason why they're so big is just because this situation is worth it. It's worth the time, it's worth the effort. And for, for two, it's so much fun painting so big. <laughs> I just kind of get to immerse myself in my work and kind of just throw whatever I want at the painting and solve it. <laughs> and so, well, can you say the second part of that question? Well, I just wonder what's next for these paintings. I think that they tell a really compelling story, a story, and you said yourself, you know, that this is something that you feel like you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a plan for the paintings to, to do something? Um, well, I think it would be nice if I sold some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've been thinking about putting them in other galleries as well and uh, telling the same story that I was able to tell and kind of just spreading that story around um, where I can reach. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of what my plan is. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> as a person that studies language and that has been very familiar with many different languages, I can say um, language to the point can be very limiting. Uh, language, um, sometimes, a lot of times we can catch ourselves not being able to describe the feeling that we have just by words. And uh, sometimes I would have a hard time expressing myself uh, by just speaking. And I think one of the Abby's strengths that sometimes, a lot of times she'll tell me like, I just can't describe it. But then once she has a canvas and a pencil in her hand, she tells the story better than anyone could. And I think, I wish I had a gift like this because those pictures help us all, helped me even to immerse myself into the stories of my family, of what my parents had to go through. And I can talk as much as I can here, but I think by looking just at the picture of my dad driving or my mom reaching out her hand to somebody, you have a lot more understanding of the situation that they've been in. And I think, I think that's what, the coolest thing about all those paintings. They get to tell the story in the way you wouldn't have been able to tell it to anybody. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, because <laughs> I can just make another one. <laughs> I think that gives me an opportunity to make more. <laughs> yes, Alba. Oh, somebody asked me this question the other day. Um, I, I don't have a favorite painting, for one, because every painting, I, I relive my experience that I had with each one, and I think to myself, okay, this is what I did, and I can think back to the growth that I had through each painting, and I love each one for that. It helped me develop my, in my skills, and I just see, you, you may see each painting as the subject, but I see each painting as an experience and as a love. And so for that, I don't have a favorite painting, but I did, I do see an experience, and I loved each experience that I had. Any other questions? <laughs> Any up there? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys.
I just wanted to say, before I leave tonight and before all of you guys leave, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Jason and Andy. <laughs> you guys have been such a beacon for me throughout this whole process. And I have just learned so much from you guys. You guys are amazing mentors. <laughs> and my friends, <laughs> more than mentors. I just wanted to thank you guys. <laughs> This is another tremendous evening. I really appreciate that you are here in person. Others are reading about this in the free press or watching it on KUIC. Um, but there's, there's something special about being here.